You are about to listen to a message from Root River Community Church. If you live in the Rushford, Minnesota area and do not have a church home, we would love to have you at one of our Sunday morning services. For more information about our church, visit our website at rootriver.org. We hope and pray that God speaks to you through this message. remind everybody that it's not just enough to come to church, but we want to say it with me. We want to we want to be the church. As we walk into church, we say we're not just going to church, we want to be the church. We want to pray for people, be a blessing to others. As we walk out of these doors, we say we want to be the church. And we, as we enter into the grocery store, into our neighborhoods, into our workplace, our family, uh, every place that we go, we want to be the church. I've got a goal that everybody tells somebody about Jesus this year. And if all you're doing is coming to church, let me tell you, that's a boring way to live life. Like God has so much more for you in the kingdom of God than just coming to church. He wants us to say it with me one more time to be the church. And we got these bracelets made up for you, made available to you at our connect table in the lobby for free. Can I hear a good amen, somebody? And so take that, let it be a reminder to you to be the church. Throughout this series, we've been referencing Mark chapter 12. Jesus has asked the question, Jesus, what's the greatest, most important commandment out there? And Jesus responds by saying, you need, you need to love the Lord your God with, help me out, with all your heart and with and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus is like, I'm not settled with 50% of your life or even 99% of your life. Just as a husband is looking for a 100% commitment from his wife or vice versa, God is after a 100% all-in kind of commitment from each and every one of us. And I got to tell you what, even right now, examine your heart. Examine your life. Is there any sin that you're still hanging on to? Is there any kind of like lack of faith that you're still hanging on to? Any kind of doubt? I'm telling you what, surrender it to God and go all in with God. And you'll be glad that you do. Like God wants, this, want God, God wants to give you this abundant life and it's available for you if you really go all in. Jesus says the second most important commandment is this. You are to love your neighbor as your, say it with me, as your, as yourself. Now this is a tricky thing to do, right? And this is the whole premise of the series because love is war. People let us down. People fail you. Your spouse ticks you off. Your kids disappoint you. Your parents disappoint you. The coworker, the boss, whatever it might be, people fail you and they disappoint you. They hurt you. They say things that hurt you and it all lets you down. But to love somebody like you love your neighbor as yourself, it takes war, not with that person, but within yourself to overcome those feelings of bitter, bitterness and all those different things that each and every one of us face. I want got a message for you this morning called The Basics of Love and War. And we're going to review two different concepts that we've looked at in the past, in the past couple of years at Root River. Love and respect, and then the five love languages. And I got to tell you what, uh, Krista and I, we don't do a lot of marital counseling, but when we do, we say, we can tell you all that we know in like an hour. And the whole time, we're talking about the five love languages and love and respect. You can look at pretty much any issue when it comes to marriage, and though it looks different on the surface, a lot of times it boils down to a lack of love and a lack of respect. And so we're going to review this here this morning. So the first basics of love and war is love and respect. Got to tell you what, this is a book that's out there, Christian author, Great Christian Principles. It's a good read for you. You'll be blessed if you go over this. It, it boils down to this, though. Women need, this is your chance to say amen, women. Women need love. Can I hear a good amen? amen. Like they, even a man chimed in, Jackson. <laughs> like they need love. They need to feel cherished. They need to feel wanted. They need to feel loved. And, and I got to tell you what, it takes a sacrifice to do this. They need to feel like they're number one in the room. And this, this is a way to express love. Uh, even during the first service, Krista and I, we don't often sit by each other at church because I'm usually up here or something like that. Or right now she's back in nursery. Well, for first service during announcements, we, we happen to be sitting together in the front row which is very rare. It happens like one time a year. 
And Krista told me a long time ago, she's like, sometimes I just wish we could sit together. And then she's like, and then you could put your arm around me and kind of snuggle up next to me. And then you can whisper things in my ear. And I'm like, like what? What would I whisper in your ear? She's like, I don't know. And I'm like, Krista, I'm never going to do that because it's so disrespectful. I mean, for what's happening in the service, you know? And, but, but she's like, it would just mean a lot to me. So first service during announcements, I snuggled up to Krista. I put my arm around her. And I whispered things into her ear while Josh was doing announcements. Like, and I'm just telling you what, like, I did it, and it's a way to love my wife. It expresses that I love her. Women need to feel loved. Now, you would think that men need to feel loved as well, but actually the Bible tells us something different. Men need to feel respect. They need to feel like the man. They need to feel like what they say and the decisions that they make will be respected. They need to feel like what they're doing is enough, even though a lot of times it's not. But, uh, but from the wife, the man needs to feel this sense of respect, not in a domineering way, okay, but just in a respectful kind of way. The Bible tells us this, Ephesians 5, 33, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. And man, we love ourselves. Like, we love to look in the mirror. I could look in the mirror all day at myself like, and say, man, I look great. Wives are different. They're like, man, I look horrible. You know, that's typically a wife. Men, we automatically love ourselves. The Bible's teaching us, love your wife the same way. Some of you women are laughing, like you know this is true. And the wife must, say with me, must respect, respect her husband. Now, again, this is something our culture doesn't get. And so when Krista and I do marital counseling, the, the, the man's issues are obvious. He's lacking love, and it's obvious. You can list out this, 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 this is what you're doing wrong. The wife, we spend actually the most amount of time on her because it's a little less obvious the ways of disrespect that she's showing. It's the eye rolling. It's the second guessing. It's, it's the kind of taking control of the situation. All these different things express disrespect. Now, when a woman feels love, she will natu more naturally reach out with respect, okay? When the man feels respected, he will more naturally reach out with love. And this creates a healthy cycle where you go on and on and on and on and on. But so often, couples are the opposite of this. The man feels disrespect, he reaches out with unloving words or actions. The wife feels no love, she reaches out with disrespect. Let me share you with some examples. From our own marriage, Krista and I, we learned early on that we need to apply this to our life. And, and again, the man, it's obvious how he does not love, it's less obvious how the wife disrespects. In our marriage, uh, early on, Krista was after me. She was trying to get me to be the spiritual leader of our home. I really had no idea what that, mean, what that meant or what that would look like. But basically, Krista was saying, Mike, I want you to pray with us. I want you to pray with me. And when we go to bed at night, I want you to pray with me. I want you to have like a, a little devotion, a little time in, in the Word where you say, Krista, this is what I'm learning. And I heard this. I heard, you're not doing enough. You'll never be good enough. I heard disrespect, 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 okay? Wrong attitude to have, right? And I'll admit that, but that's what I heard. And so many men, they hear that time and time and time. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. It communicates this disrespect. Wives, what I'm encouraging you to do is back off a little bit, okay, and, and give it over to God. Like, seriously, take, take, take time in prayer. Pray for your husband. Krista did that, and what wound up happening is another man came along, and he challenged me. And a man can take a challenge from another man. For some reason, we're just really insecure, and we can't take it from our wives, okay? But so many men and ladies, they operate with no respect. They operate with unloved, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, Genesis 3.16, it actually teaches us that our sin nature is set up against us. It says this about wives, and your desire will be to control your 
husband. Like that is a wife's sinful desire. You got to get in there and control them. If they would just do this a little bit better, if they would just do this a little bit different, if they would only know this, if they would only read the highlight sections of my book, so I'll just highlight a bunch of them and put it on the bed, you know, like, like it's just this little bit of control, okay? Well intended. Like your desire is really to help your husband. Your desire is really to help your family, but it comes across as disrespect, and your desire will be to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Now, man's tendency is to shrink back. And you see this even with Adam and Eve. Like, his wife is talking to the devil. Where is he? Like, he says nothing. And typically, us men, we shrink back. And we don't express love in the way of leadership. Got to tell you what, though. There's this phrase going around that love is war. Can you say that with me? One, two, three. Love is war. Love is war. And even though our sin nature is set up against us as it comes to couples, love is war. And we need to like buckle down and say, no, I will respect my husband. I will cheer him on and not coach him on. Like I will be his biggest fan. I will be his cheerleader. Man in the room. It's like us saying, no, I'm going to wage war against my tendencies. I'm going to do all that I can to whisper into my wife's ear and to cherish her and to make her feel so, so special. Here's another example. You want to hear one more story from our marriage? No? Okay, I'll move on. You don't want to hear it. Okay, here's the story. It's a couple weeks ago, Krista, uh, we were at the mall, and she fills out one of those like sweepstakes things where you, you enter to win, right? And uh, a few weeks later, the mall calls and says, guess what, Krista o Osterbauer, is this you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just won a trip for two to the Bahamas. And Krista hangs up the phone. She's like, she's running to me. She says, Mike, you'll never believe I don't win anything. Like, we just won a trip to the Bahamas. Now, you got to understand, in our marriage, Krista is like the glass is 99% full. I'm the total opposite. I'm like, the glass is empty. It's bone dry. There's no water there at all. Like, that's, that's me. And so I say, Krista, it's a scam. Like, it's not true. Don't even look into it. She's like, why? Can I look into it a little bit? I'm like, okay, look into it. I was leaving for work. She says, what time are you going to be home for lunch? Are you coming home for lunch today? I'm like, I can come home anytime. Got a busy day, though, so can it be a quick lunch? No problem. Come home at noon. I say, okay, I'll be there at noon. I come home at noon. There's no lunch. But Krista runs up to me. She's like, Mike, I've been on the phone all morning. We're going to the Bahamas. This thing is legit. And I'm like, Krista, it's not legit. It's a scam. And then I say it like this. OK, this is bad. But I say, and where's lunch? Like, <laughs> I thought this was lunchtime. Where's lunch? OK, and then for the next hour or so, like, we just like got into this crazy cycle of disrespect and unlove. What I heard was my time isn't valuable. My job isn't important. Like it doesn't matter when I go to work or nothing, okay? That's what I heard by her not being ready as she said she would be. I heard disrespect, okay? Wrong attitude, just what I heard, just telling you the truth, okay? Uh, what she heard was Mike doesn't love me. He doesn't support me. I win one thing in my entire lifetime and the guy can't even, for a minute, like, entertain the thought that this is real, you know? And she was just after me saying, like, wow, Krista, that's amazing. That's, that would be so fun if we went to the Bahamas, you know? Uh, turns out we're not going to go to the Bahamas, by the way, if anybody's wondering. I don't think I clarified that. But I'm telling you what, like, love and respect, it comes out in subtle ways. But if you don't dial this in, in your marriage or any other relationship, like, the relationship will be destroyed over time. Let's look at five love languages. This is also a book. It's actually several books. They make it for marriages, for raising kids, for teenagers. Even in the workplace, you can apply this concept to your life. Basically, there are five different ways you and I give and receive love. The ways we speak love. They are words of affirmation, gifts, acts of service, physical touch, and quality time. You can receive love in all five, but each of us has a preferred love language that you speak. 
Let me give you an example. It's really illustrated by this example. A woman comes in for counseling and says to the counselor, he just doesn't love me. The counselor, the counselor replies, well, what makes you think that way? The woman says, well, just yesterday, he was busy the whole time. He never stopped once to sit down and to talk with me. He's just too busy. He mowed the lawn. He put down mulch. He changed the oil in the minivan. He brought our kids to soccer. He barbecued for dinner. And then he cleaned up everything. The counselor looked at the man. What's your deal, bud? Why don't you love your wife? And he says, are you kidding me? For crying out loud, I spent the whole day just yesterday loving my wife. I mowed her lawn because I heard her complain about it getting too long. I put down mulch in her garden. I changed oil in the minivan. I don't even like minivans. I brought our kids to soccer. I don't even like soccer. I made dinner and then I cleaned up everything and washed the dishes. She's the one who sits around and doesn't love me. And so you can hear in that little made up scenario, this actually like, this is a mock, uh, what happened many times throughout counseling. We hear this all the time. One person says, she's too busy. The other person says, uh, he just serves all the time. All these different things. You can hear it in this, that all the wife is looking for is for the man to stop and to sit down and talk. She's looking for quality time. What he's looking for and how he is, he is expressing love is through acts of service. Many people are well-intended, but they're speaking the wrong love language. Almost all parents love their kids. Who in here loves their kids? If your kid is sitting next to you, put your hand up, okay? <laughs> Almost all parents love their kids, but not all kids feel love. Why? Because oftentimes the parent is speaking the wrong love language. I took two years of Spanish throughout high school and I know very poco, right? It's hard work to learn another language, but it, it, takes, it takes this attitude where it's like, love is war. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna learn my spouse, my kid, my grandkids, my coworker. I'm gonna learn their love language so that I can love them more effectively. You can take the test online. You can read the books. Uh, basically, you can, you can dial this into any relationship. Let's look at them closely. Words of affirmation. My daughter, Audra, we believe that she is words of affirmation. I take all my kids on dates. Uh, we cycle through them once a week. They're, they last about a half an hour. My daughter, Audra, as soon as she gets the little treat, she's like, hey, can we go home? I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, we just got here. We can't just go home. So I know that quality time is not her thing. Gifts are not her thing. At her birthday party in February, she didn't even care about the gifts. In fact, her brother Gabe had to remind her that there were gifts at birthday parties. Like, she doesn't care about gifts. But I tell you what, it takes like one moment where I'm one-on-one -on -one with her and I say, Audra, you are the most beautiful little six-year-old girl that I've ever seen. And I affirm her. It takes those words of affirmation and it just lights her up. You see this throughout scripture, Song of Songs. This is a husband talking to a wife. You are beautiful, my darling. Beautiful beyond words. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your smile is flawless. Your lips are like scarlet ribbon. And your mouth, oh, this is getting juicy here. Your mouth is inviting. Tell you what, you say that to a woman whose primary love language is words of affirmation and she'll melt. You say that to a woman whose primary love language is acts of service, and she'll be like, real cute. Now just take out the trash for like the fifth time. You know, just get to it. Show me some love, okay? Back to Song of Songs. This is the wife talking about the man. Words of affirmation. My beloved is radiant and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. Like he's the man. His arms are rods of gold. Krista says that to me all the time. Even though I know she's lying through her teeth. His arms are rod to go. Okay? These are examples of words of affirmation. I really appreciate what you did. You're a star student. God has his hand on your life. You look nice in that outfit. It's Krista saying to me, I liked your sermon. You're a great leader. It's expressing love. It's expressing respect. Proverbs 18, 21 says, The tongue 
has the power of life and what is it? But typically we speak death. We only talk when something is bad and we need to talk. We only talk to the kids when something is going wrong. We only talk and we speak death. Love is war and we need to wage war on that. Sometimes we need to bite our tongue more and we need to speak life more. We need to speak these words of affirmation. Here's the second one, receiving gifts. My son Gabe is the gifts guy. Again, at Audra's birthday party, he's the one bringing out Audra's gifts. He's the one even helping Audra unwrap the gifts. He's like, you're doing it too slow. Let me show you how it's done. You know, I could give my son Gabe a rock. And if I said, Gabe, I just saw this rock and it made me think of you, Gabe would be the kid who would take the rock, put it in a box, and 20 years later say, my dad gave me this rock. <laughs> it just meant the world to me. Most kids would throw the rock away, you know? But Gabe is the guy who's, whose primary love language is receiving gifts. And so if I want to communicate love to him, I need to not worry about quality time. I need to not worry so much about words of affirmation. I need to worry about giving him gifts. Proverbs 18, 16 says this, or 18, 21 says this, giving a gift can open up doors, and it really can. It can be a way to express love. Joseph received a gift of a coat of many colors from his father. It expressed love. Joshua 15, Caleb gave his daughter and son-in-law a plot of land with a spring, spring on it. It was a way to express love. It doesn't have to be expensive. It could be discounted flowers at the store, right? It could be wildflowers that you find in someone's yard. It could be finding flowers at a wedding, you know, that you're at or something like that or a funeral. I don't know. Maybe that's pushing it. it. Don't go there. That'd be a bad one. But it doesn't have to be expensive all the time. In fact, Krista, her primary love language is receiving gifts. They're never, they never have to be expensive gifts, but they're just gifts that mean I was thinking about you. It could be a candy bar. Lately, it's been these little Bay Pop things, B-A-I, in case if anybody's wondering about Krista. B-A-I. And so what I did is I stocked up on these things when they're on sale. And I got a stash somewhere in the house. She doesn't know where they are. And just one by one, 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 one a week or so, I bring them out and say, Krista, I was thinking about you. And it's a way to communicate love. Everybody wins, right? Everybody wins. Here's another one, acts of service. Our son Isaiah is acts of service. Uh, just yesterday, Josh Confetti stopped by. And Isaiah's like pushing people out of the way, saying, no, I will get the door. And he's like, he wants to serve. He wants to help out. He's always the kid who's like doing things when we don't even ask. So I know that if I want to express love to my son Isaiah, again, I don't worry about quality time. Don't worry about gifts, words of affirmation. I worry about acts of service, serving him. 1 John 3.18 says this, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Let's serve each other. Let's put our words into actions. It could be taking out the trash, making dinner, making the bed, doing laundry, taking the kids to the dentist, babysitting your grandkids. It could be snow blowing your neighbor's driveway. Thank you so much, Jackson King. Like all these different things. Thank you, Jackson. Let express love to each other. Here's another thing, physical touch. Physical touch is a way to express love. And this is non-sexual physical touch. For guys in the room, that does exist, okay? Just, just so you know. Uh, if, before a baby understands the meaning of love, they feel love through physical touch. My dad, from time to time, he expresses love through physical touch. He'll, let you, he'll just give me these big, long hugs that, like, get awkward, almost awkwardly long. You know what I'm saying? And then sometimes he'll just like sniff the top of my head. You know, and, and I'll just receive it. I'm just like, I know he's just loving me. You know, you remember when your kids were young and you just sniff them for some reason? Like, you know, that's what my dad still does to me, okay? And it's a way that he's expressing love, okay? My son Ben is this way, where he's always the kid like snuggling up to me on the couch or like when I'm tucking them in at night, he's always the kid holding on to me, not wanting me to go. It's physical touch. Genesis 33 verse 4 
says this, but Esau ran towards Jacob, his brother, and hugged and kissed him. Then the two brothers started crying, like that physical interaction that they had, it was meaningful for them, okay? Uh, so it could be holding hands, it could be kissing, it could be putting your arm around your grandchild or something like that. It could be as your spouse walks by, you just kind of gently touch them. It could be your spouse walks by, you just stick your foot out and trip them or something like that. <laughs> Physical touch, no? Okay, here's the last one, quality time. My daughter Ella is quality time to a T. On her dates that are supposed to last a half an hour, she's always the one pushing the envelope. The other kids wanted to go, go home 25 minutes ago. Ella's the one who says, Dad, can we just stay a little bit longer? Can we just do something else? Like, I want to be with you. Now, I'm quality time. So automatically, it's easy for me to connect to Ella because we speak the same love language. You know, some people, it's like, man, we're connecting. We're clicking. Other people, it's like, we're not clicking. It's oftentimes because you're speaking the wrong love language or you don't know how to receive love through their own love language. With Ella, it's different because we speak the same language, okay? It just means that it takes more work Loving the other kids, loving my, spy, loving my spouse. Now, for wives in the room or for women in the room, quality time looks different than for men. Typically, women want to talk 15, we just learned this in our potluck small group, 15 hours a week with each other, okay? So that means that they want face-to-face -face quality time, quality conversation and intera interaction. With men, they want something completely different. They want shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder quality time. This friendship, companionship, bonding kind of quality time. Sometimes Krista will just come and sit down with me in the garage as I'm working on something. We're not even talking, but it communicates love to me. I, she doesn't even say anything. She's not even like paying attention to what I'm doing. She's just with me. And I'm like, baby, I don't even know what you're doing but I love it, like I love that you're right here with me. Titus 2 verse four, I wanna invite Mona on up as I close here. Titus 2 verse four, it says this, these older women must train the younger women to, what does it say, to love their husbands and their children. Now think about this. Why does a woman need to be told how to love? Isn't it just naturally ingrained within them? I mean, wouldn't we think that? And it actually is ingrained within them, within them to love, but they still need to be trained. Why? It's because oftentimes you can have the best intentions to love, but you can be speaking the wrong language. And so women, men, everybody, we really need to be trained in how to love, how to communicate love. And just so you know, when it says women to love their husbands, the Greek word love here is not agape love, the most deep, sincere kind of love. This is phileo love. It, it talks about this friendship kind of love. And that's what men are looking for from their wives. These older women, they must train the younger women. Like there's things to learn. There's love languages to learn and to become fluent in to love their husbands and their children. Tell you what, love is war. Can I hear a good amen, somebody? Like, it really is. Has anybody ever been hurt by somebody you love? Can I just see your hands? And even if it's the person sitting next to you, it's amazing. Like, the people that we love so much are the people that we're often hurt by so frequently. Love is war. And it takes like this war, this battle, to say, I'm to love my wife even when I don't feel respect. And for wives to say, I'm to respect my husband even when I don't feel love. It takes this war, this battle, to learn other languages. It's tough to learn a language. It's tough to learn Spanish. It's tough to be bilingual or trilingual or quadlingual. I don't even know if that's a thing. Like, it's tough, but relationships are ruined when we don't take effort to do those sorts of things. Have you ever been to Mexico or another foreign country and you go down there, you're trying to get on a bus and go somewhere, but the language barrier is just huge, right? And the relationship then isn't that deep. It's the same with love languages. 
We need to get better at this. The devil is after your family. The devil is after and trying to put a wedge between you and your spouse, your children, your parents, your grandchildren. But the name of Jesus is stronger. Can I hear a good amen, somebody? It really is. And I'm praying that throughout this series that God has put principles in our lives to break some of these bondages in between our relationships. And I'm praying that even if we don't apply them, that somehow, some way, the Holy Spirit will sweep through our midst and convict our hearts of bitterness and unforgiveness and say, love is war. Like, we need to love people well. Can I hear a good amen, somebody? Amen. Can I pray with you and pray a blessing over you? Jesus, we just speak the name of Jesus over each and every person here, over each and every relationship here. We speak breakthrough. We speak forgiveness. We speak an end to bitterness, God. We speak that your spirit might supernaturally, God, restore what the devil has broken. And Lord, I pray for somebody here this morning who's never really had a relationship with you. Again, we speak against the devil, the God of this age who comes to blind the minds of unbelievers, and we say no. We pray that even in this room, right now, by your Spirit's power, that people would start to see just how deep and how strong and how wide your great love for each and every person is here. God, we speak breakthrough over our church, over the cities that are represented here. In Jesus' name, all God's people said together, Amen. You just listened to a message from Root River Community Church. For more information about our church or how to make Jesus the Lord of your life, visit our website at rootriver.org.